please join me in welcoming Brett Smith. Thank you very much. So a couple of things. Uh, do y'all mind if I do not use this microphone? This will not project, but this is to record, but I don't really want to use this. Can y'all hear me okay? Okay, good. I'd rather do that and then uh, have carry around this microphone. But thank you very much. Um, this is incredibly flattering to, that I heard that how many people signed up to hear about counterculture. Um, and the context of that is, is 21 years ago when I started the company with a gentleman named Fred Houck. And what I want to do today is just talk a little bit about that, um, sort of the early years of counterculture, and uh, maybe spend about a minute per year um, taking us up to, to where we are today, and really how, um, through the years, embracing sustainability uh, and transparency as part of that, has, uh, has modeled our uh, business plan, has modeled our company, has helped us, and I think has helped us uh, have the success that we've had. So, I will take you back for just a minute. Uh, 21 years ago, um, I was in graduate school at Carolina uh, getting my MBA and I wanted to start a company. The product wasn't as important as I had the entrepreneurial itch. Um, when I applied to business school, they had those ridiculous questions, where do you see yourself in five years and 10 years? And uh, in both of those questions I answered with, I, I will have started a company or I'm just trying to do something with a small business for some reason, that was in my mind. But I, I kept seeing this company called Starbucks on the headlines. <laughs> and uh, believe it or not, back then they had about 700 stores. And now they have, I think, 20,000 and they're opening up three or four a day in China. So an amazing company. Um, and I have a lot of respect for Starbucks. And I think most people in our segment of the industry should really thank Starbucks for introducing coffee to a much larger audience. Um, and, and believe it or not, between my first and second year of business school, I worked on a municipal bond trading desk at T. Rowe Price in Baltimore. Um, I had a finance background and I wanted to, that's what internships are for, to see what you want to do. But once again, the, the news, the Bloomberg kept talking about Starbucks, Starbucks, Starbucks. And long story short, I ended up meeting a guy named Fred Houck, who was with a tiny little coffee company in Durham. I th thought I knew everything about business because I had an MBA. And uh, he certainly knew a lot about coffee, and he wanted to go on his own as well. So we met in a restaurant in, in Chapel Hill that's no longer there called Pie Wacket, and we ended up talking for about three hours. Um, I'd never met him before. I talked to him on the phone. But after that meeting, um, we decided we were going to go into business together. And so uh, we, we, uh, that was summer of 1994. So we spent the rest of that year um, trying to get a loan from the bank, an SBA loan, and, and that worked out well. And, and so we started and ended up uh, roasting our first coffee in April of 1995. Uh, we sold our first order to Pops over in Durham. Um, I think it was for $400. I used to have a copy of the check. But it was a, it was a big moment. But for us, it was interesting. From the beginning, um, we were we, we didn't really talk about it. We didn't talk about sustainability like it's talked about today. In fact, I go back to the business school and they have, you know, you can sort of major, if you will, in sustainability. We didn't even use the term back then. But Fred and I, we, we, like I said, we didn't really talk about it, but there was just sort of this connection and, and this uh, a common goal we had of, of what we call just building a great company. That sounds simple, but for us, building a great company was a company that, that uh, you know, ultimately we could be very proud of. And what does that mean? It means we, we wanted a place to build a place where people would want to work and, and, and get their needs met, a place that, uh, that really um, uh, worked with suppliers in a certain way, that throughout the whole supply chain, we wanted to be very proud of what we did. Um, we were focusing on quality from the beginning. Uh, we've never operated coffee shops. We're just wholesale. So we just roast and we sell to uh, to restaurants and coffee shops and specialty grocery stores. Back then, believe it or not, there were very few coffee shops. There were, I think, two in Chapel Hill. Um, and so we really sort of cut our teeth, if you will. Fred had experience in the business, but we, we really, uh, the early years, we were selling to uh, the culinary community in the Triangle. And, and the Triangle is blessed with an amazing culinary community. And, and, and it's also blessed with some amazingly demanding chefs. And, uh, and I learned my lesson about walking in you know, right before service time and asking a chef what his order is for the day. Um, I've been chewed out many times, but you know, I learned my lesson. But the point with that is we were certainly influenced by a lot of the farm to table before it even 
you know, was talked about like it's talked about today. So we were fortunate early on to be pushed towards quality and to be pushed sort of, uh, not pushed, but uh, given the opportunity to do things that now are re referred to as sort of the triple bottom line. Um, from the beginning, we tried to have benefits for employees. Uh, from the beginning, we wanted to work closely with farmers. Um, although back then, when we would buy coffee, we'd get a fax, which some people probably have never seen a fax. Uh, and it would curl up and roll behind the file cabinet. Uh, but but that, that's how you'd buy coffee. And you look at it and say, okay, Colombian coffee, uh, I'll buy. And they'd have certain specifics, but that's how you'd buy coffee. Um, but since then, over the years, We've gone back the supply chain all the way back to the farmers, and I'll expand on that a little bit more in a minute. Um, but early on, we wanted to, uh, we, we wanted to, like I said, have great benefits for the uh, employees. We wanted to really have the, uh, we wanted to go out and, and compete and really work hard in the market, but do it in a way that sort of garnered the respect of our peers. You know, we were gonna, we're gonna go hard, but we're gonna do it in a way that, that earns respect as opposed to just sort of sneaking in the best way possible. And we, we committed to being very selective along the way, um, trying to work with the best, trying to work with people who not only um, can, of course, we're gonna benefit if they buy our coffee, but can benefit from what we're doing. The fit has to be right. Um, and then another aspect to it, uh, in 1997, Fred walked in one day and he said, I've got this great idea. He said, uh, bird-friendly coffee. And I just sort of looked at him. I was like, what in the world is bird-friendly coffee? I said, do the birds eat it? Do they, you know, what, what's the deal? And Fred was a birder. Is anybody in here a birder? That's, that's a passionate bunch, man. Uh, <laughs> they get after it. And, and, and so what, what the reality that Fred was talking about is that you can have farms that are either clear cut, and if you can look around the United States, almost every field you go by is one crop, or you can have what's called a, a shade farm or a sun farm, or a sun, I mean a shade coffee, <clears throat> excuse me. And as it turns out, um, as more and more land is cleared for either uh, to build homes or to, to plant you know, monocrops, these shade plantations for coffee turn out to be an incredible habitat for migratory birds. So this, there is a link there. And so we, we came out with a coffee in 1997 um, called Sanctuary that was bird friendly. Um, and I got a lot of funny looks from people, but it was real. And we, we worked with farms that embraced an environmental standard. And that was sort of our first foray, if you will, into really looking at the environment as it relates to the supply of coffee that we bring in. So that was the foundation. Um, Fred and I wanted to, you know, we wanted to build a great company. We wanted to focus on quality. And we wanted to, uh, we wanted to do things the right way. Um, so we've continued, we continued growing. We, we started off, we were in 750 square feet in a little strip mall over in Durham. And some of our early customers were Magnolia Grill, Angus Barn, Crook's Corner, Nana's, Pops, Farrington. Um, and so we, we continued to grow and continue to evolve the business. Um, then we started looking, uh, once again, we were embracing what, what is now referred to as the triple bottom line before we even talked about it, before we sort of realized we were doing that. And, and I think, I can't remember exactly when, but we went to a meeting, a uh, coffee conference in, at the uh, Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center, I guess, up in DC. And it was a coffee conference. And these about 250 coffee professionals, Starbucks was there, everybody you, you know, and then tons of people that you don't know that are in the industry. We sat around and we talked about what does it mean to have a sustainable coffee supply chain. And we talked for two or three days, and believe it or not, at the end of that, the, the, big, re the big reveal was it's about, it's about uh, environmental, social, and fiscal sustainability. So the triple bottom line. So everything was heading in that direction, and we kind of looked at each other. Fred and I looked at each other and said, yeah, that's what we're already doing. And so we've continued down that path. Um, we started selling, uh, continuing to sell, obviously, to coffee shops, excuse me, to restaurants, but as the coffee shops independent coffee shops started popping up. Um, people started realizing, once again, Starbucks is an incredible company, but realizing there's, some, there's an alternative out there. There's an opportunity for a higher quality level. There's an opportunity to, uh, 
to have a different type of experience. And so we've benefited from that. So our business model, on one sense, um, let me pull up our website real quick. Um, so our business model is based on a couple of things. Um, I talked about this you know, focus on quality, the focus on sustainability. Um, and then we looked around and we started realizing that if you just take green beans, because that's what color the unroasted coffee is, and no matter how good they are, if you just turn them brown and you send them out to a customer, you're going to fail because there is a lot of competition out there. Um, I mean, there are, I don't know how many roasters there are in Raleigh, but there, it was, it's a surprising number. I think in Chicago where we sell, there are, I think, 27 different little roasters, not to mention much larger ones. So it's a very competitive market. And so what we started seeing was that this focus on sustainability, focus on transparency, and I'll dig more into that in a second, and focus on supporting our customers, um, finding the right fit, was really a, a crucial part of our business model. So education was something that we recognized is, is a very powerful thing. If you teach someone something, if you help them learn, if they advance in their career, or if you're a, uh, if, if you're a coffee shop and, and we can help you do a, a better business, that creates not only a good business connection, but it creates a real bond. Um, and it really creates a, a good business model. So we, create, we, we took a step back, I think about 13 years ago, and we, we, we wanted to really put on paper what we were about. Um, we've been talking about it for years, but we wanted to step back and we put together a vision statement, which actually I don't have it here, which is kind of amazing, but I know it. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I, I remember, I always tell the story, when I was in business school, the entrepreneurs would come in and they would talk about culture and the, and the vision statement, and I would laugh. I was like, oh, come on, that's not business. Um, that's the touchy-feely stuff. Well, it's pretty darn important. And in fact, it's been one of the, the real cornerstones of the success of our business. And um, anybody from counterculture that's here has heard me say it over and over and over and over and over again. Um, and it's, it's really three things. It's that counterculture coffee is a relentless pursuit of coffee perfection. It's counterculture is committed to real social, environmental, and fiscal sustainability. And counterculture is a dedication to creating cutting-edge coffee people. So you got three things, quality, sustainability, and education. So we've been using that to guide us. That's the objective third party in the room that keeps us in check. It's a filter. It's, it's what we turn to in case, if we're confused about a decision or confused about what, what the next step should be. So we put that vision statement in place and, and started living by it and started building the company based on that. And so one of the things we did, um, and I'll touch on the sustainability aspect more in a second, but one of the things we did is education. Like I said, if we just sold coffee and didn't support it, uh, we would fail. And so we opened up, and, and we also knew that if we brought someone to our roasting facility uh, over in Durham, the, the tiny one at the time, it's a little bit larger now, and y'all are all welcome to come by. I'll put a plug in for that in a second. Um, uh, yeah, Friday's at 10 a.m., so you can leave here and drive directly over there. Uh, they're, they're, ta they're tastings, and they last about an hour, and it's, we'll explore coffee. So, um, But the idea was, uh, how do we take that that energy, that experience, that smell, the sounds, the people, the culture of counterculture that's in our home office, how do we take that on the road? We can't take the roasters, the actual machines on the road, but we could take every, everything else. And we could take the process of, of tasting, cupping, that's what it's called, and it's an incredible experience. And not to mention you get you know, hyped on caffeine, and it's a <laughs> sensory experience, and so it's a wonderful thing, and you get to explore coffee and learn more about coffee. <laughs> So we decided to take that show on the road and we, we opened up a satellite office because it's easy to open up a roastery in a town. It's hard to get to the next town over and sell because there's so much competition. So we started opening up what, we, what eventually became training centers. And a training center, it's hard to explain. If you walk in, you'll get it the second you see it. But it's like a coffee shop. It's not open to the public. It's like um, it's, it's, uh, we've got espresso machines set up and areas for brewing. We, uh, over the years, we've designed a curriculum called Counterintelligence that has different classes that are designed for coffee professionals. And uh, it, it's, it scratches our itch, so to speak, in terms of wanting to educate and wanting our customers to be better. It's pretty simple. If they're better, they're more informed, they're more excited about the coffee. If they do a better job preparing it, 
they buy more coffee and it's a virtuous cycle. But it also creates a great bond um, and a relationship where there's give and take. Um, and so we started making, building these training centers. And the first one was in Charlotte. We learned a lot there. We, we don't have them in Charlotte uh, anymore. But we, the second one, I believe, was in Asheville. But over the years, we've continued adding training centers. And it's helped us grow on a national level. Once again, realize we do not have retail shops. Um, so a lot of our, our, uh, our peers, our um, competition out there, they'll have a retail shop. And it's great for marketing. And, um, but we wanted to just stick to what we were doing. So we offer education for customers for free. A lot of people want to charge for it. We've, we, we've gone back and forth. We've charged a little, but now we're back to, to exclusive customers free. We're giving it away, um, which sort of feeds into this overall theme that I'm going to hopefully develop in terms of being very transparent with what we're doing. Um, and the training centers have been great. It's been a unique advantage for us in the market. We now have 11 training centers, including our facility in Durham. And one of those uh, we roast in Durham. We also roast in one other location uh, just outside of San Francisco. So right now we're in Atlanta, Asheville, Charleston, of course in Durham, DC, Philly, Boston, New York, Chicago. We opened up this past, was it this past summer? Uh, this past summer in LA down on Sunset, which is really cool. Uh, big town out there, by the way. And, and, <laughs> And, and San Francisco as well. And right now we have three in the queue, Seattle, uh, Miami, and Dallas. And we're continuing to grow at, at the rate we want. We target 15 to 20% growth, and, and we're, we're able to maintain that. We don't have outside investors, so we can do it our way. Um, and and we, we just feel like there's such a great opportunity for us to continue sharing what we do, sharing our culture, sharing um, our philosophy about purchasing. If you go to our website, you can see these are some of the training centers. If I can learn how to control this. So you can see the different ones. And I'm not doing a good job of really showing them. But we have, where's Matt, who helped us design our headquarters back there and helped us design one of these. So nice, nice job. So a couple of things. So th this is sort of the core of our, our model. Um, we now we're now approaching 100 employees. We brought on 18 additional employees in the last quarter. So we're on big growth mode. It's an incredibly large market, but we're relatively small in that. We'll do about 3 million pounds of coffee, which seems like a lot. But uh, Folgers that does, uh, excuse me, Smuckers that owns Folgers, they'll do about 900 million pounds. Um, Starbucks is approaching a billion pounds on an annual basis. So in the grand scheme of things, we're pretty small, but we continue to set that bar pretty high. But one of the things um, that we've done over the years that I think has worked incredibly well, and, and it sounds obvious, as a coffee company, we need a supply of great coffee. We need a supply that's consistent. We need a supply that's dynamic. Um, we need a supply that's unique. Uh, once again, there's a lot of great coffee. The, the offerings now are not just facts, you know, it's not a facts offering with Buy Colombian. There is um, lots of small roasters, lots of competitors can get access to great coffees. So we realized years ago one of the key things for us to be successful was to develop long-term relationships with farmer partners. Historically, you go down to origin. I'm simplifying this, but you go down to origin and you, you, uh, you line up coffees from different farmers, and April's submitted some coffee, and Kelsey, is that right? Mm -hmm. Submitted some coffee, and we'll cup it, we'll taste it, we'll say, sorry, you're in. Okay, good job, we're gonna buy your coffee this year. Then you come back next year, it's like, all right, let's cup again. Sorry, April, you did it this year, good job. <laughs> so you can get great quality with that, but you can see over time, we felt like there was a, a, a better opportunity to develop a long-term relationship Sorry, April, with Kelsey. Uh, but but um, what we try to do is find farmers uh, that are heading down a road and are willing to learn and are willing to work with us um, and are willing to challenge us and we challenge them. So we created a position, if you think of the traditional customer support model, we created a producer support model, producer relations. And we've been traveling to origin and working closely with farmers. There's something powerful about breaking bread with them. There's something powerful about getting to know them on a personal level. The world's very small with the internet now, so we can Skype and um, it's, you know, it's pretty amazing. You can Skype a farmer in Rwanda, which is crazy. But, um, but that close relationship is, is really pretty powerful. And then what that has allowed us to do is to understand their needs, 
to really appreciate what they're all about. We, we will show them our, our financials. We will, um, I presented to a group in Mexico of about 150, 300 farmers uh, about 12 years ago. And we broke down our financials in terms of percentage. And um, there were other coffee companies there that were shocked. What, what are you, why are y'all doing that? And it was also funny to me because there was really, really big companies. I'll name them. Uh, Green Mountain was sitting in the front row. Uh, Green Mountain, who will do 600 million pounds this year. But they're in the front row taking their notes about Counterculture's financials, which is, <laughs> which, and I, I know the buyer, and I, was, I give her a lot of grief about that. I was like, what, what, what does that have to do with anything for you guys? But it was, but what we found is showing that information really creates a bond. Um, and then we've started, uh, We've started um, working with them to, uh, once again, understand their needs and understand the risks that they take. Coffee is one crop a year. If you plant a new a plant, it takes five years to, to produce the coffee that we know. It's a big part of their income saying, OK, Kelsey, this year I want you to try these things. If it doesn't work out, we're going back to April. So uh, that just doesn't work. And so we figured out a buying strategy and a buying model where we can share the risk and we can, if they practice best practices, then we'll ultimately we'll buy the coffee and we've, we've created sales channels um, to accommodate that. So um, another thing that we've done through the years, I think we're doing good on time here, is um, yeah, we, we've started producing a transparency report. Um, transparency report where we talk about our operations. We talk about our, our carbon footprint. We publish the prices we pay to farmers. Uh, and I had some friends in the industry that got really mad at us for doing that. Um, but at the end of the day, we think that's important. We want to be very open. And it's, it has not come back to bite us in the least. Um, in fact, I think it set us apart uh, in, in many respects. Uh, they're laughing back there. Maybe, maybe they know of when it has bitten us. Uh, but, uh, but ultimately, um, we, we think being open being transparent, uh, having contracts, a transparency contract with the entire supply chain from the farmer all the way to us where everybody can see what each individual is getting paid, um, that has led to stronger relationships. It's led to access to better coffees. It's led to, um, to us, I think, can, being able to continue to open training centers and, and, you know, people in this room interested in counterculture. I think all that has been part of it. Um, and I want to sort of finish with one story. I don't know if it's pure transparency, but it's, it's a different way to think about business um, in terms of what the benefit is sometimes of giving stuff away. Um, and this behind me, I don't know if everybody can see it, but this is the coffee taster's flavor wheel. Okay? So the background story is that there was originally, this was uh, an evolution of a flavor wheel that had been in the coffee industry since the early 90s. It was developed by a guy named Ted Lingle. It was taken from the wine industry. It became the standard. Every tasting room for a coffee company had the, the old flavor wheel. But our, our head buyer, Tim Hill, who's sort of this mad scientist, um, he, he came to me and he was saying, yeah, I'm going to take the flavor wheel. And I, it just doesn't work anymore. It's developed in the early 90s. Tastes have changed. The industry has evolved. And I want to take a look at it and make it more intuitive. The other one actually had a misspelled word, and uh, that was always the joke. If somebody's desc describing a coffee using that descriptor, then you're like, eh, you're <laughs> amateur. So, uh, um, pose poser. But, uh, but ultimately, the, long story short, he took it and he evolved it. He evolved it to make it more intuitive to the, the current taste. He evolved it to make it more relevant. And, we laid it out like this, and, and then we, we published it on our website. And we put it up for free. And people said, oh, you should charge for it. Well, we started seeing people, it, we started noticing people were downloading it more and more and more. And then we started seeing on social media that it, it started appearing literally in uh, all over the world, Portugal, Australia. Um, I would visit friends uh, in the coffee industry at other companies, and they'd say, hey, Brett, our Monday morning buying meeting, our buying team came in with copies of the counterculture tasters wheel, the flavor wheel. And, and real quick, what it is, is these are the descriptors when you're tasting coffee. I assume uh, you'll, you'll probably figure that out. But 
people all over, Green Mountain, their buyers were doing it, uh, Royal Cup out of Birmingham, uh, Pete's out of San Francisco, um, then a lot of importers. And it was unbelievable. And we started seeing more and more downloads. We started seeing it everywhere. I think you had a picture from where? Iceland. Iceland, on the wall. And, um, and, and it was a, a, a sort of funny story. And I can say this because I know all the parties involved. The original producer of the other flavor wheel was the, the Industry Association, SCAA. Um, ultimately, the Wall Street Journal picked up on this. And they did a story on the front page of the Wall Street Journal saying, how about some meat-like coffee uh, in the morning? Because that's one of the flavor descriptors. <laughs> and they talked about how you know, this flavor wheel and gave the story that I just gave. But they compared it to the old flavor wheel. And they concluded the, the, the article by saying, you can download the flavor wheel for free from counterculture, or you can pay $5 and download it from the SCAA. <laughs> and, uh, and the executive director is a dear friend. He was interviewed, and they said, are you bitter that counterculture has done this? He's like, bitter? Why should I be bitter? I'm not bitter. He came off as the most bitter person in the world. <laughs> and I literally saw him 10 minutes after I, I uh, read the article. I went up an escalator, and he's standing at the top. I went and hugged him. I was like, Rick, it's OK to be bitter. And I won't tell you what he told me. Uh, <laughs> But ultimately, we've had over 100,000 downloads. And it's just been one of those weird things that if, you know, if people still say, well, you should have charged for it. You should have. And we would much rather be open, share it, instead of keeping it for ourselves, because it's a very useful tool. Um, instead of keeping it for ourselves, we wanted to share it with people. We wanted to put it out there. Um, the goal wasn't 100,000 downloads. The goal was to take something in the industry and push it forward. But the fact that it has 100,000 downloads is not bad. It's pretty cool. Um, so what I want to do now is, because we're running a little, we're, we're bumping up against time. Um, but I, I want to open up for any questions you, you might have. I've gone over 21 years like that. Um, I'll sort of conclude before we open up questions is, is this focus on sustainability, this focus, which is this weird thing. It sounds easy, but it's kind of a hard thing to put your hands around. What does it mean to be sustainable? And in the process of trying to clarify our thoughts about that, we went to visit Patagonia. We visited Burt's locally. We, visit, we talked to King Arthur Flower. We talked to a lot of folks. The good news is most of them were saying, we're just trying to figure this stuff out ourselves. Um, there's a common goal of trying to push forward and do it now, 10 years, 100 years from now, minimal impact. And what we're finding is sharing the information, sharing what we find about some of our research to the larger market has, has come back and paid for itself in, in space and come back and, and really worked out to be a critical and important part of our success. And a lot of the, it, it's amazing to me, um, I see people now all over the country and sometimes all over the world that come up, counterculture is great. You guys are focused on sustainability. I was in Korea. People were saying that to me. It blows me away. But it's, it, it really has resonated. Um, and uh, it's been a very powerful thing. So with that, I want to open it up to see if there are any questions uh, that I can answer. I've gone over a lot. Yes? Could you talk a little bit about the uh, people part of the triple bottom line? Sure philosophies on yeah, retaining good people, developing people? Yeah, yeah so uh, our initial focus w was, was at origin, but we also initially just tried to have nice, good benefits, um, a baseline. Uh, uh, at origin, we work very closely, like I said, with the farmer partners. We have a, a program where they can apply for grants to invest in their communities. So we take a penny a pound and put it, put it aside for them. And they apply for grants. Um, we, uh, sometimes it's tough love with the farmer partners. Uh, we have a, a gentleman that we work with in Kenya. And we rejected his coffee for three or four times before uh, he, he said, OK, I'm going to listen to you guys. And ultimately, um, the coffee was much better and will pay a higher price. Um, back to understanding what their needs are, understanding what the risk is for them and trying to appropriately share some of that risk. So that's where it, 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 it that's the, a big focus at Origin. Here back in the States, um, we're constantly working on it. We're constantly working on uh, benefits. We have a green fund where if you have your own um, idea for your own personal sustainability initiative, the company will subsidize a portion of that or, or match 
your spending. Um, health benefits, pay 90% of the uh, medical benefits of the individual. We have profit sharing. I'm proud to say we've had 10 years of quarterly profit sharing. We have a 401k where we have an aggressive match. So there, there are financial needs that I think need to be met. And we're constantly working on that. But then there, I think there's, I think counterculture, we hope it's a great place to, to work. Um, we try to hire from within. We try to um, challenge people, get them in the right places in the company, um, listen, uh, try to pull ideas from throughout the, the company. And I think it's, uh, I think, you know, it's not for everyone. It's a very dynamic and a very changing environment. Um, and, and sometimes, through no fault of anybody, that just doesn't work for people. But ultimately, I think it's, uh, we're, we're just trying to make it, that to me is, is one of the most important things, because I think, it's, you hear it a lot, you know, you, the, the people are the most important thing, and it's true. I'm a good gracious, it's true. You know, a company is a collection of people. And, and so the hope is to try to create an environment where everybody can really thrive, recognize that. We just hired an HR manager for the first time, um, and I was fighting, and I was like, we don't need that, but we, we do, uh, 100 people. And, <laughs> and, and we're starting to, to do better systems for onbo onboarding and continuing education. We have a pushing potential fund where um, if you want to, you know, get the, the company will pay for, uh, provide other funds for you to, to push your potential if it's a project that you're working on. So we really think about that. Um, it's so critical. Uh, I think it's a good place to work. We have some former employees in here. <laughs> I just wanted to say anecdotally, I'm an ex-employee of counterculture. Um, all of those benefits were incredible, and it was hard to take for granted. The, the green fund, like, I want to build a compost in my backyard, and it's going to cost me 500 bucks. Well, countercultural matching is <coughs> towards that project. Just because they felt like that was a good thing for me to do, and they were happy that I was going to do that. And all that stuff was amazing and, and great, but for four years, twice a year, they flew all the employees into Durham, and we'd meet at the headquarters, and we'd have a company meeting, and we'd all get to sit down and talk to each other, and I'd listen to that guy, give the vision statement again and again and again. I think the best thing for me as an employee was that we had a shared vision, and we were kind of like all in it together, and we were on the same page, and we knew we were all working towards within our different roles. And even though we were spread out all across the country, which Jenny and I are our own company now, and it's crazy. Slingshot cough. Oh. Cobra. Yeah. <laughs> Rockstar. All across the country, um, you know, it was just an, a really amazing place to work because of that shared mission and drive. And, uh, and Brent's office was across from mine when I worked there, and his door was open, and I could just go in. And I was asleep. Yeah, so. <laughs> let's, let's do one thing. I know some people might have to leave, but uh, I did want to, uh, over the years, we've, we, we've certainly gotten better at communicating our message. And um, we put together a nice video, and Christy helped with this. Come here. Yay. Good job. Um, and this, I think this, this does a much better job of, of, of my rambling in terms of talking about our commitment as a company. And I think that, can you hear that? At Counterculture Coffee, we believe in pushing potential in every aspect of what we do. To make that possible, we are committed to transparency. Transparency enables ongoing improvement, holds us all accountable to our commitments, and helps our customers know more about the products they buy. The push for improvement is a never-ending process, especially in our coffee buying relationships. At the Buzir Guhinwa washing station in Burundi, for example, Owner Ramadan Salam started an organic composting operation to lessen their dependence on chemical inputs, a huge step towards more sustainable coffee that should be celebrated. To better reflect this idea of sustainability as a continuum, how we talk about our coffee buying practices continues to evolve. We're not changing the way we buy coffee, we're still focused on incredible quality coffee grown sustainably. We are changing how we gather information and share it through our transparency report. As we've learned more over the years, our coffee buying philosophy and reporting have taken different, increasingly transparent forms. In 1996, we were an early proponent of bird-friendly coffee, recognizing the correlation between thriving bird habitats and healthy coffee farms. With a heightened emphasis on fair trade practices within the industry, 
we expanded our understanding of sustainable coffee beyond strictly environmental measures to include fiscal and social considerations as well. Recognizing the limitations of fair trade, we pioneered a third-party verified direct trade model that better reflected our focus on relationships and quality. The next step in this evolution is complete purchasing transparency. The best way to show how we push potential isn't to oversimplify things into yes or no categories. There isn't some magical line that you can cross over from unsustainable to sustainable coffee production. To help us evaluate this type of progress, some of the metrics that we will track and report include how much we pay for coffee, each coffee's quality score, and our direct communication with producers. Frequent communications help us create lasting peer-to-peer -peer relationships. We're also working to establish protocols for measuring sustainability with producers and are working with them to set yearly quality and sustainability goals. Tracking and sharing these metrics pushes everyone in the supply chain, including us, to get better. We're not just sharing information about the most sustainable coffees we buy, we're working to share information about every coffee we buy. This level of transparency is unique in the coffee industry and we hope it empowers everyone involved to achieve a more equitable supply chain. The push for more sustainable coffee doesn't stop with counterculture. We're sharing comprehensive information to empower you to draw your own conclusions about the progress of our partnerships and our coffees, helping you know more about the products you buy. So that's it, and that's, that's sort of the culmination of 21 years of thinking about transparency. So, any more questions? Christy, good job with the video. Yeah. So we wrap up.